everyone and welcome to church. I'm so pleased that you've joined us today. If you're joining us at the 10, 4 or 7, then we're really pleased to have you with us. Our hope and our prayer is that you get to encounter the risen Jesus again, or perhaps even for the first time. Today I'm really looking forward to having Rosalind, who's going to be leading us in worship. Uh, Nathan is going to be bringing us to the next part in our series in Psalm 23. And then we also have Chris McLean, all the way from Canada, who's going to be sharing a story with us to help us lift our eyes towards the risen King, to know that he's uh, moving today and that, to stir our faith. Before we get to that stuff, let's just hear from the Rock Kids team who are going to tell us a little bit about what they're up to today. Hi, everyone. Firstly, we just wanted to start by saying a huge thank you and well done to all the Rock Kids that were involved in the Lord's Prayer last week. You guys were brilliant and we just love getting to see your faces. So this week in Rock Kids, we're looking at the story of the Ten Commandments and how Moses was given these by God. So head over to rock.gg forward slash Sunday dash Rock Kids, where you'll find the worship songs, a story and all the activities and they're available all day. Psalm 67 says this. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We're going to go into a time of worship. As we're worshipping, let's give God the glory. Let's praise him. Let's heap praises upon him because he is just so worth it all. And actually what we find is when we praise God, when we worship him, when we allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, we're then emboldened to share the same incredible truth of the cross with others. Worship and mission are, are linked so powerfully. So let's worship God. Let's be inspired by what he's done for us. Let's worship together. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost, my fear exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not Decided I'm not giving up You won't give up on me You won't give up on me Your love is holding on It won't let go I feel it breaking out Like an echo Your love is holding on It won't let go I feel it breaking out Like an echo An echo in my soul Start until it is complete. 
As Christians, we have the unique opportunity to serve our island, but also the world in prayer. We can offer our worries, our um, concerns, the issues that we see around us, also in the news to him, and know that he cares, that he is listening, that he changes things. I believe wholeheartedly that God cares for every single life. And we can see that demonstrated by what Jesus did on the cross. Here at the church, we want to make sure that we are championing for things in prayer. And so on the screen in a few moments, you're gonna see um, some points, some prayer points that we believe are really important to us, but important to see breakthrough elsewhere in the world as well. So, when they come up, there'll be a little timer. Why don't you just pray for those topics, pray through the bullet points, pray through uh, the issues that God will break through, that God will make a way, that we will become uh, a church, a world that is more representative of God's kingdom here on earth.
Revelation 7 verse 9 says this. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, heaven's picture of what the church looks like, of what the people who worship God look like, is not governed by race, language, but every people worshipping our Lord as sovereign, who's saviour above all. And we want our church locally to reflect that. And we want to do that in ourselves. We want to make sure that in our hearts we are, we're allowing that to happen. But also in terms of how we operate as a church, we want to make sure we're allowing that to happen as well. Ben Lindsay, who's, um, who's a really helpful voice in, in this uh, conversation, um, has recently, last year, released a book, says, we need to talk about race. And if you haven't read this, I'd really encourage you to read it. He's a really helpful voice amongst all the voices going on out there to give a helpful insight into how as a church we should respond to what we're seeing globally, but to also to what needs to happen locally as well. So I just really encourage you to read that. I hope uh, this blesses you. I'm gonna be praying for you. And I would you just join us in praying this week as we go about our lives, and as we go about praying consistently over the topics that we've just talked about. Here at The Rock, we love to hear about stories of how God is impacting lives, how people are encountering him for the first time. And, and, and just those stories do something in us, don't they? And they stir up faith, they stir up hope and courage. And over these next few weeks, uh, we've got a good friend of ours, uh, Chris McLean, that's based in a place just outside Toronto in Canada. And uh, he's gonna just share with us some stories that will hopefully just stir up something in us, stir up faith of how God is on the move. So um, last time we heard from Chris just sharing a story about um, how he came across and met uh, a couple from Brazil and just how uh, just um, uh, over 60 people beginning to, to gather there as a, as a church, which is just phenomenal. So it's great to have Chris again, part two. Um, and uh, Chris, you're in, in Canada right now. You, you began kind of lockdown in this, during this pandemic um, around the middle of March, around pretty much uh, most uh, countries did. Um, how long are you in, in lockdown at the moment? Well, we're, we're, yeah, we're still in lockdown at the moment and we will be till the 30th of June. Uh, and that's the, that's the date we've got at the moment. It goes a few weeks at a time. Um, our numbers are going up at the moment. So um, I think things are probably pulling back to have less happening um, because, uh, you know, we're, we're still in problems, particularly our long term care homes. Okay. And so that's making it very difficult for people. So it's important for us as a church to keep praying um, for what's going on uh, in Canada and around the world with people that are still facing, uh, even though we've got, gone down to zero up to today, um, it's, it's making sure that others countries are being uh, prayed for as well. So Chris, another story. Another story. Well, here's a story that I'm sort of involved with and in many ways I'm not involved with. I'd like to be in England to be involved with it. Uh, and that is last time I was over uh, in uh, England, I got the chance to speak at a leaders meeting uh, just north of London. Um, spoke on, I remember speaking on uh, the gospel needs to be proclaimed and the gospel needs to be preserved. And I was speaking on the, the importance of the gospel. Well, at the end of it, in going through and explaining the gospel clearly, um, one of the couples who lead a church there of around 200, came up to me at the end and most people were sort of chit-chatting to me in the line and they were saying, oh, I've got an auntie who lives in Canada and I've got a grandmother who lived in Canada. It was all that sort of talk. And suddenly this couple said to me, we listened to you this morning and we lead a church and we realized we're not really Christians. 
and uh, that was a, that took me a bit by surprise. Uh, they said, you know, what should we do? And I said, well, I think you should give your lives to Christ. So I had the joy of leading them to Christ, which was which was great. I, I love to do that. Um, but then they said, well, what should we do about our church? We've been leading it for eight years. Um, should we continue to lead it or what should we do? And I said, well, if you've been leading it for eight years and you've not been Christians, how about leading it for eight years and being Christian? And so they said, great, what would we do? So I Skyped them when I got back here and we talked through how to run an alpha course. And talked. Uh, I did one session with their leaders as well on how to run a group and stuff like that. And then really left it to them because I'm here. And one of the really exciting things for me to hear as things have progressed was they had around 200 people. They pretty well got everybody they could on the, on the uh, Alpha course, including some visitors. And they ran the Alpha course. And out of 200, 173 of them came to Christ. Now, when I say that, these are people who clearly had some faith and were, were um, meeting together on a Sunday morning, singing songs. Um, it was very much a social type church. Um, I wanted to be very careful because uh, this couple didn't want um, to lose their position in the church by revealing what had happened at the leaders meeting. But they ran this alpha course and now the whole church has come alive. And I kept saying to them, oh, you know, I'm going to come over. And they said, oh, we'd love that to happen. But to this day, I've not been there. But it's been really great to witness it's that God has been at work in a place. So having led them to Christ, it's always good, isn't it, to see what they go on in God to do. And a whole church has come alive in England through them putting their faith in Christ and then leading their people, shepherding their people through an alpha course. And mm. they've seen that at that church. They can't remember the last time that church had baptism. And so it's been a real joy filled celebration. I'm sure with the pandemic, that was a lot more difficult to follow up, but the news I keep getting from them is, Hey, we look forward to when actually you can come and meet with our people. <laughs> That's but also it's great to witness that God is on the move. That's a phrase that I've often heard you use and to see that um, what began as a small work of God, God is well able to tend that and to grow that and to bear fruit through it. And so what, what a privilege for me, a church I've never been to that's come alive. Uh, <laughs> just thrilled to be like a small part of it at the beginning. So uh, for me, that's amazing. And I will go there one day. <laughs> I, I, I think that that's such an encouragement that um, really kind of the theme of that story, isn't it? Is, is that when you pray with a couple, they admit actually this is, we're not quite lined up with our relationship with God. You pray with them and you step out and pray with them and look at the fruit that that happened, how God uses that to really kind of wake up a church, as you say, and people coming to know Christ in a huge amount of numbers. So I get encouraged by hearing stories like that. It's, it's amazing. I think it's interesting as well that they, they, were, very, they were a very social church. So I'm just saying they're, they're, I think things revolved in their church around being social, being a people. The gospel was somewhat missing. It was all very much, you know, serving the community and you know, all sorts of good things. Mm. But actually the gospel was missing. And, and isn't it great that God could take what they did have, which is this social gathering, and people can come to Christ and be led to Christ through that. I think it's great. That's amazing. Chris, that's, that, thank you so much. Look forward to hearing more stories um, from you. Um, church, be encouraged by that. And, uh, and also often when you hear at The Rock, we say when, when we pray, coincidences happen or things happen because prayer is inviting God's presence into who we're praying for or the situation we're praying into. So let's be bold in our prayers. Let's be bold as we stand with others and, and help lead people to knowing more about Christ. What an amazing adventure we're called into. Last week, John kicked us off so well in our series in Psalm 23. Nathan's about to bring us the next part. And just an encouragement, you know, Psalm 23 is, is, is all about God's incredible love for us, how he comforts us, how he guides us, how, how we should fear no evil because he's with us, he's for us. And in a few weeks, we're also going to look at Psalm 96, which talks all about, you know, in light of all this amazing stuff, 
Our heart's response is to praise him, is to give him the glory, is to, is to set our eyes upon our, our Lord and to worship him because that's what he deserves. Why don't we just watch this little video as a reminder of what Psalm 23 says. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's great you've been able to join us today. You are so welcome uh, to be tuning in uh, to our online service. And I'm so thankful for the technology that we have that enables us to keep connected. And whether you are based in Guernsey or from somewhere else in the world, thank you for tuning in. And it is so good that you're able to be with us. As we've just seen that video about um, the Psalm 23, the six verses, just to help some people that may not be familiar um, with the book of Psalms, it's found in the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, there's 150 of them, and they're a mix of songs and poems, and they range from uh, Psalms of crying out to God, asking for help uh, as they're living through despair moments in their life. And then there's times of like calling out to worship, like when we're gonna look at Psalm 96. It's that sense of coming together and recognizing that God is an awesome God, recognizing that his loving kindness never ends. And there's that whole sense of praising him and, and taking delight in him. And as John um, shared so well last week, just talking about how Psalms are a great way to kind of reflect and meditate on our relationship with God and his goodness and faithfulness. And today we are gonna be looking at verse two and three. And so David, the, the writer of this Psalm, grew up as a shepherd boy. And so he has this firsthand experience of, of the, the role and the responsibility of being a shepherd. And in this Psalm, in the first four verses, it refers to God being this shepherd and, and, and we as people of God are his sheep. So let's just remind ourselves, verse two and three just says this. He says, it says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul and he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, I think you know, already know this, but sheep are quite daft. Uh, they got a tendency to, to wander off uh, they can get themselves stuck. And of course, they're, they're also liable to being attacked by predators, as I think they make a good snack. Now, it helps me to realise how reliant we are in God when we reflect on Psalm 23. And just, just I want to remind you of these headlines. It's, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness. Now, do you notice something in those two verses? It often says, he, referring to that God is our shepherd, that he offers all things to us. Nowhere in the verses does it say, hey, Nathan got involved in helping God, that Nathan can also provide the answer, that, that Nathan uh, is, is kind of being an advisor to God in, in how he should kind of lead and help people. No, there's, there's none of me in that at all. It's, it's all about God. I can't offer anything. God is this awesome God. All things 
come from him. They all belong to him. He is our shepherd. He is the king of kings, the one from everlasting to everlasting. I'm thinking of this kind of shepherd analogy. I was, I was reminded this week of uh, when I was a kid, I'd sometimes be flicking through the um, TV with the four channels that we had at the time and came across this TV program called One Man and His Dog on BBC Two. And I think it pretty much was like a farmer and competing with other farmers. They all had a border collie and they would compete uh, with this whole thing of trying to get sheep into a pen. So the farmer would be kind of uh, whistling and making all kinds of different noises to, to the dog to kind of come around and get the sheep into the pen. Now, personally at the time, I didn't really get the point of the program. It didn't make much sense to me. But it also showed that actually at no point did any of the sheep kind of stand up and say, time out, time out, listen, Farmer, I've, I've got this figured out. I know how to get the rest of the sheep in and, uh, and actually, we, yeah, we can get in that pen. Let me have a word with the lads and we'll kind of get back into the pen for you. No, it doesn't happen like that. The sheep are daft. They kind of go off in their group and they would go off in all different directions. That's why they use the border collie to, to kind of guide the dog, uh, to guide the sheep into um, the pen. It requires someone with the authority over the sheep to guide and lead and bring courage and direction. You see, God is our provider. He offers us protection. His care for his people, which is you and I, is unending. It's unfailing. And he is this good God. Let's just dig a little bit deeper as we just look at some of the different things that it describes about God being this shepherd. It says he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now in the animal world, uh, we know that if you watch the kind of Sir David Attenborough documentaries and so on, you, you know that actually animals lying down in the, in the wild is a vulnerable position, probably the most vulnerable position that an animal can be. And as you watch these documentaries, you know, whether it's a pack or a pride or, or whatever, that there's always going to be at least one on alert. They're, they've got to be keeping an eye that maybe there's predators around or, or actually um, something else. They've got to be aware of what's going on. I, I'm just thinking of actually like a meerkats. There's always a meerkat that's kind of standing up watching while the others are either sleeping or, or playing. And they take their turns in that role of keeping an eye on what's going on. Now in the domestic world, it is said when a dog is turned on its back and it's exposing its belly, legs stretched out, that it actually says that a dog feels secure and relaxed. However, can I just give you a little bit of a word of warning? If a, if a cat lies on its back showing its belly, don't be fooled, it's a trap, okay? Now, back to the story for David, he knows how green pastures is really important when you have a dry and rainy season. Now, finding a place for, for your flock, for your sheep to keep nourished and secure, you need to find those green pastures. And God makes us to lie down in green pastures is, a, is an invitation for you to dwell with him. Just with the green pastures in, in Psalm 65, we jump to another psalm, just read out a few of these verses. It says, you visit the earth and water it, you greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its ridges abundantly. You settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers. You bless its growth. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with, with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain, they shout for joy, they also sing. And that sense of life, and God invites you into this life of, of these green pastures. And in the scripture of Psalm 23, pastures actually means a dwelling place. It, it even means like a home. So when you put your life in the hands of God, when you invite him into your life, he invites you to dwell with him. He's that provider of these green pastures and he empowers you by his Holy Spirit to live a life under his care. Now, I just want to give a bit of a word of warning. 
Um, don't listen to a kind of a false gospel that can go around, that can even be preached. That if you give your life to God, your life is going to become really easy and you're going to benefit from riches and, uh, and actually everything's going to just work out really well for you. We still live in a broken world and we all still carry mess and it might be our background, our past that we're still trying to work through. Yes, God is a miraculous God and things can change. Just, just a click of his fingers and those do happen, those, those amazing stories. I want to see more of those happen. But at the same time, as people are working through stuff, it doesn't just simply go away. Sometimes you have to work through it. But when you give your life to him, because what Jesus has done for, for you and I, and we'll come on to that a little bit later on, is that it tells us that we've become a new creation. The old has gone. And it means that we'll be forever with him in his presence. So even when we leave this earth, we go to a better place where there is no pain or hurt or anything like that. We get to worship him for the rest of eternity. And it's that coming into the presence of our heavenly father. That's where we rejoice. That's where our peace comes. That's where everything happens, where we go, God is a good God. He leads me beside still waters. And as David continues this theme of God being our shepherd, we come to, he leads us beside still waters. Now, in Guernsey, we have our four seasons. And, um, but we wouldn't say that we have a rainy or dry season. We tend to say, yes, it's going to probably be wet in the winter, but we're likely also at times to have a wet summer as well. But in the Middle East and uh, in those areas, if you had um, with deserts and rugged terrain and so on, they have a dry and wet season. So in a dry season, the land becomes barren and the search for green pastures becomes much and much harder task. Now, the shepherd has to lead the flock to drinking water as it can become very quickly a life or death situation for the sheep. So God leads us to a place of refreshment. As I say before, he is our provider. And it's important to understand what the word still means in this psalm. Now, throughout the Bible, the word still is used 101 times. And if you're familiar with the Bible, you will know the stories of Jesus calming the storm. He's in the boat with his disciples. In fact, he's, at, he's asleep at the back of the boat and, uh, and his uh, disciples are, are panicking. They're fearing for their lives. So they wake Jesus. And what happens? Jesus comes to the side of the boat and just says he speaks to the storm and he says, be still. And immediately the storm stops. Now, the meaning of still there means uh, to be muzzled. And if you've got a, um, a, an animal that needs to be muzzled, it means that actually it, it loses that power to be able to bite or attack people. And so muzzle just means that it loses its power, it loses its authority, because we know that Jesus has authority over everything. And so it becomes this powerless thing which happened with that storm with Jesus. And then you go to Psalm 46, verse 10. And this verse is often quoted, be still and know that I am God. And although I use that verse to remind myself of, of, of who God is, and if I'm in a, in a low place, then I can look to him and I got to remind myself that, hey, I put my life in him. And I know that, that he is the one that just asked me to be still and know who he is. But that, that verse actually means that it's actually a warning to, to warring nations. And that word of still means that to withdraw or abandon. So out of the 85 times still is mentioned in the Old Testament, I hope you're still with me on this, the meaning of the word in Psalm 23 is unique to the other 84 times. It means a resting place, comfortable and quiet. And can you begin to see how gentle and pastoral Psalm 23 actually is? God leads us, leads us into a place of rest, to be refreshed in him. Now in open hillsides, this would have been rarely happening as there would have been the constant threat to the life of sheep. But here David writes uh, this beautiful, beautiful psalm and for us to remind ourselves and to remind one another how there's always a secure place to find rest and to be refreshed, all because of our great heavenly father. 
And it's like those moments when you come and know that he just says, come and be still. I'll take you besides still waters, that deep breath of fresh air that you just take in and then you breathe out. And it's this sense of I'm in a place of safety and security because my father is with me. And recently I've been reflecting on my own life over the last few months and I encourage you to keep reflecting on your own life. Just actually, how can you keep growing and learning about your relationship with him? And sometimes we we pretend that we have it all together. In front of others, we can put up a front, we can pretend, hey, I know that because I do that often where I just think it's better and safer and easier just to say I'm doing all right. When in reality, behind the scenes, it can be a bit of a mess. It can be chaotic or just simply you're just feeling tired and, and actually those things can just have an impact on your life. And in preparation for today, I was, I was out walking the other day and I was, I was just suddenly reminded of the story of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. And Jesus is welcomed into Martha's house and while she's busy rushing around, serving, Mary just sits at Jesus' feet. Martha grumbles to Jesus, but He says this, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will never be taken away from her. Now, just put that into context. I haven't been grumbling and comparing myself with others. That's not what it's about. But I realized when I was thinking on this, that how much rushing around I've been doing, being so consumed and trying to do things in my own strength, in my own ability, even though I know that my strength and my ability is limited. I've ended up feeling tired. And there's been times I've felt actually spiritually empty because I've just been trying to do things in my own strength. And I've realized at times I've acted like Martha, running around trying to figure this out during this whole pandemic, this lockdown of trying to keep church together, trying to kind of make sure everyone is doing okay ensuring the staff team who are trying to work out how to keep pressing on. But I was often missing the point. I was often missing sitting at the feet of Jesus, sitting beside still waters. And I'm saying that because I wanna help you to not feel like you have to pretend in life. Pretend that we have it all together. However, at the same time, I want to encourage you, this is an encouragement for me as well, not to accept that this is the way it's got to be. I want to learn, I want to continue to have people alongside me that do ask, how are you doing? I'm praying for you. Those things make such a difference in my own life. The encouragement that stirs us up to keep going and keep growing and to know God more and more. And I want to be more like Mary in that story of of actually just sitting and being still being in a resting place of knowing what it is to follow him. Let's move on. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Now, I don't know about you, but I enjoy these kind of TV programs when I ever do get to sit down to watch them of um, restoration programs like CAR, SOS or Grand Designs, when they restore old buildings or obviously old vehicles. And there's something about seeing something so tired, worn out, that seems no longer fit for purpose. In fact, it's on the brink of being broken up, but yet it's complete change around and they're restored. Now, having your soul restored is when God turns you back and brings you strength. So often in life, we can easily drift, whether that's through falling into temptation or we get distracted or we spend time away from God, we can find ourselves going down the wrong path. But this is the incredible truth. God is always there to restore. He's always there to help renew us and put us back on the right path. And during the lockdown, we've all experienced ups and downs. And, and, and one thing that's, that's going to help us, I think, as we move forward is that it's not going to be one person that says, oh, I remember when I went through a lockdown and a pandemic, we're all going to be able to say, yeah, we were there. We all experienced it. But we all maybe have a different kind of um, slant on the experiences that we have. Maybe you have lived in a chaotic household where you've got small children on, and they're just running around and you don't know what to do with them. It might be that you're from a single parent home and, and you've had to try and cope on your own raising children. Maybe you've been on your own and, and actually the house has been quiet and empty because it's just 
you and the pain of feeling isolated. Some people in this church have become new parents in the midst of it, but then still being cut off from being able to have friends and family to come and see the newborn. It could be the concern for loved ones that are living in other parts of the world that maybe they haven't got under control with, um, with this whole COVID-19, so you've got concern for loved ones. The list goes on and on. And this can lead us to feeling completely and utterly empty, or even hopelessness can seep in. But Jesus said, let, your, let not your heart be troubled. And later on in that same chapter in John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus has made a way, and he's always there to provide a way back to him. So don't let your heart be troubled. But if you are going through stuff in your life, bring it to him. In prayer, just have a conversation with him. Ask for his help. And I, and I know that times where I've been in despair, times I've felt low, times I've, I've gone through struggles, I know that his love has not failed over my life. I know he's always there. And his love for us will never run out. There will never be a drought with him. I'm hoping you get in the picture. We are extremely, extremely limited what we can do in our own strength. We get tired, worn out. We wander off and get lost. We're like those sheep. Yet with these two verses, they tell us that God provides a place for rest to be nourished, to be still, and to be strengthened. And it's God that keeps heading us in the right direction. We are in safe hands when we're in relationship with God. So maybe you're watching this today. Maybe you're thinking, actually, I've been so far away from God that I don't know how to get back, or I'm just totally new to this. How do I put my trust in God? Well, you may have heard of being told in, in, in that one of the words that you hear in church is the gospel, which is the good news, which is all about what Jesus has done for us. The fact that we have lived a life away from God, the fact that we have lived our own lives where sin, which separates us from the closeness of being with God, has meant that we've lived a life where we wanted to do our own thing, where we think we're our own gods. We think we've got it all sorted. Or we're so lost, we don't know what to do. But simply when Jesus came, he came to earth and he was perfect. Yet he became sin. It meant that he went to the cross and died this cruel death, not just physical, but also this separation from his father, our heavenly father. And the fact that he died on that cross for you and for me. He made a way that if we decide to turn away from our old life, it's, it's costly. You have to sacrifice your old life, but you're saying, actually, this is a much better life. This life of being in relationship with Jesus, there's no life like it. It's changed my life. But the moment you say, Lord, I'm sorry for the way that I've lived my life. I recognize the way I've, I've lived it, it's meant it's, I've been separated from you. But I want to thank you for what you did on the cross. The very fact you died, but you rose from the dead. You have overcome all my sin. You have overcome death. And now I can have this relationship with you. Come into my life. And you can pray that prayer in a few moments. And as we draw to the close, I just want to spend two minutes for us to practice to be still. I don't know about you, but I like to fidget. I, I, I find it hard to stay quiet and to uh, sit still and not think about other stuff that's going on around us. But I just want to encourage us, use this time to practice, to sit still. And you can think about this psalm. Maybe you're finding it hard to find peace right now, feeling lost and hurt, and your life is full of chaos. Use these two minutes, and you can use, I'd encourage you to use more, but just for these two minutes, simply dwell on the presence of Jesus. Invite him into your life. You can use these two minutes just to pray. But can I just encourage you, if you pray that prayer, don't keep it to yourself. Get in touch with us online. 
I didn't really implore you to do that because you can't live a life following Jesus on your own. You need people around you. You need to be part of a church family who encourage and support you and help you grow. And during these two minutes, our hosts online, they will not post any messages or they won't respond to any messages for those two minutes. We want to just focus this time on being still, resting in God's presence. I just want to say thank you for listening. built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name Christ
these trumpets sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone. Father, stand before. 